Well, hello there, and welcome to Talk of the Sex. I'm Christy Pearson with Friends of the Hennepin County Library. And I'm Scott Dimstra, Hennepin County Library Director, and I want to welcome you to the Minneapolis Library for this fantastic author event. Now, tonight we are thrilled to present in partnership with Birch Bark Books, Tommy Orange, in conversation with the legendary Louise Erdrich. And as... Okay. <laughs> And as we begin tonight's program, on behalf of the library and the friends, we would like to offer a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that in Hennepin County, we live and work in the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Dakota people. Today, the effects of colonialization, settler, settlerism, and oppression are felt both locally and by all indigenous communities. By offering this acknowledgement, we commit to recognizing indigenous nations and to holding ourselves accountable for the work of reconciliation. At the library, we further this work by centering the voices of Native American staff and by working through community liaisons to build reciprocal relationships that ensure our services reflect and serve local indigenous people. We acknowledge that this work is ongoing and informed by the weight of history and demands of the present. Thank you, Scott. Now we would next like to recognize our wonderful sponsors who are help making this free series possible. So a big thank you to Ice House, the Star Tribune, and LSE Architects. So let's give them a hand. <laughs> and with all of you library fans out here in the audience, we are eager to share just a sneak peek into an exciting new initiative launching at the library called Let's Read. Scott, would you mind sharing just a few I details about to, this awesome program? I would love to. Just last year, the library debuted a new strategic plan, affirming its position to inspire lifelong learning in our communities with literacy as the foundation of that learning. Recent data shows that students who cannot read by the end of third grade are four times more likely to drop out of high school. Yet today in Minneapolis, fewer than one in three indigenous, black, and Latino students are reading at grade level. And we know that our library is uniquely positioned to help in, that com in communities. Thanks to the financial support of friends and of the Hennepin County Library, Let's Read pilot programs are now at six of our libraries. Hosmer, Franklin, North Regional, and Minneapolis, Brookdale and Brooklyn Center, and Oxborough and Bloomington, and Brooklyn Park Library, with plans to expand to new locations in 2024 and 2025. This critical initiative represents a concrete steps towards ensuring literacy for all and collective strides towards educational equity. If you have a child that may need help in reading or if you yourself are interested in becoming a volunteer, please reach out to us. Thank you. So you can learn more about ways to engage in your events guide or in the email that will be following up will be sent tomorrow. So just click to learn more. So thank you so much for your support of our beloved library and life changing programs like Let's Read. We are truly grateful. And now to introduce our special guests, it is my pleasure to welcome Anthony Sabalas from Birch Park Books. Please join me in welcoming Anthony. Buju Anthony Sabalis Indigenous Cause Gakapakan Inda Gakapakan Indunjaba Missy Zaga Eganin Ashinakadik Ashkanagan Wenjabayan Nin Mama Unjaba Missy Zaga Eganin. My name is Anthony Sabalis. I am an events coordinator and bookseller at Birch Park Books. We extend our heartfelt gratitude to the staff of Central Library and to Talk of the Stacks for their wonderful partnership on this evening's conversation between Tommy Orange and Louise Erdrich in celebration of Wandering Stars. In our world today, these days and nights of grief and uncertainty, for so many it can be all too easy to lose the path on these journeys of ours without even knowing, to feel without direction, lost in the chaos swirl of one bad news story, then another, then another, carried alongside the weight of all of our personal challenges, difficulties, and tragedies. It can feel as though we are left to wander the dark alone, in isolation, separate from one another, without hope. But hope is a light that is always there, though distant those stars may sometimes seem. In the space of a deep breath in and out, we can suddenly become aware of its brilliant radiance, of possibility itself, much like what we find in wandering stars where a family is gripped by the cruel resonant echo of profound tragedy. Through tragedy, there remains the glimmer of hope, a hallmark of this novel, of Tommy Orange's equally breathtaking debut, There, There. 
in the graceful poetic prose that is the lives of Opal, Jackie, Orville, Loney, and Luther, as they all carry each other toward the other side of darkness in the power of tremendous storytelling and truth speaking, much like when an indigenous relative walks through the blue door of birch bark books and sees shelves filled with stories and truth that speaks to their own lived experience, that offers reflection, compassion, and possibility, all too often denied to natives by this country, native lives who always were, are, and will be this land and we will always be. Therein exists hope. In novels like Wandering Stars, There, There, The Night Watchman, The Sentence. In the vibrant, flourishing world of indigenous literature. In conversations like the one we are about to hear, there is hope. There is inspiration and possibility. There is light. To Tommy and Louise, I say chi mi guetch for being with us this evening. I can't wait to listen and take it all in. Louise Erdrich, a member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa, is the author of many novels, as well as volumes of poetry, children's books, and a memoir of early motherhood. Her novel, The Roundhouse, won the National Book Award for Fiction. Her novels, Love Medicine and La Rose, both received the National Book Critics Circle Award for Fiction. And her novel, The Night Watchman, won the Pulitzer Prize. She lives in Minnesota with her daughters and is the owner of Birch Park Books. Tommy Orange is an enrolled member of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma. He was born and raised in Oakland, California. He currently teaches at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. His first book, There, There, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Now, please help me in giving a warm welcome to the stage, Tommy Orange and Louise Erdrich. And thank you, everybody here. Um, miigwech, gakna awia, ginoa, biyajayek nunguma nagashing, gaye, shime magic omaya. I'm really happy to see you all, Linda Noe Makanidok. That's my relatives. Hi. And also, everybody who is watching um, on whatever channel, whatever link you're on. It, it's wonderful. We have so many people. Um, I want to thank the library and everybody who's been so welcoming and all the people who are working here from the bookstore, Birch Bark Books. I want to thank Tommy, of course, for being here and for representing fashion choice. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> right. So, uh, is that all? I was, if, I, if I missed something, I'll think of it later, as always. But I'm going to start out by trying, by continuing a conversation we were having back there. And I'm going to lean back, because Tommy's kind of leaning back. So we were talking about dreams, and there's so many dreams in here that permeate this book. Um, and I told you that some of the some of the things that I thought you had experienced or someone very close to you had experienced and described were actually dreams. Are there any other? We don't have to use that as, a, as an example, but are there any other scenes that you can think of that are actually dreams? They're not actually, well, the, dreams are experience. Well, I think 
you know, dreams are, and I'd like to take, a, we, we, we had a conversation about taking um, a piece of, of data from the audience, which we'll take later. We're uh, going to do a test. Later. Yeah. Um, on all of you. I'd like to take a, an early um, piece of data uh, around this idea of dreams because um, it's, you know, it's really a cultural thing, like the value of dreams and how much do you talk about dreams and there's like this annoying um, way that I think there's a Western or American way that dreams are sort of like, there's a j running joke of like, it's annoying to talk about your dreams. Don't talk about them. Right. And there's no value to them. Right. So in the audience, do you all talk to each other about your dreams? Raise your hand if you do. If you hate them and you hate the whole subject coming up, don't raise your hand. I want to see how many. <laughs> okay, that's a decent right. show of hands where dreams yeah. are valued. There's some halfway hands too. So I think, you know, if I, I, I've had a very active dream life from my very first memories. Or some of my very first memories were dreams. Uh, the, really? One of my very first memories is my parents coming into my um, bedroom and talking to me in a language I couldn't understand and, and calmly trying to tell them, I don't know what you're saying, and them increasingly getting frustrated and then angry and yelling at me in this other language of which I was saying, like, I don't, I don't know what you're saying. And they could not take that I couldn't understand. And I obviously wasn't speaking the same language. Hmm. Um, but dreams were, as a creative person who was not creative in any outward way until I was like 25 years old, um, it's not something that I did in school or, or on my own. Um, for the most part, just no artistic anything. Um, dreams were an area where I, I felt very expansive and creative and and in a way to my detriment um, there was a lot of terror in dreams mm. so there's a lot of uh, worlds that that I experienced a lot of dying in dreams um, and so I think by the time I started writing I think there was this this real um, wealth of experience from dreaming my whole life in these ways that were, um, you know, like dreaming of dying a lot is a description of <laughs> what my dreams were. Mm -hmm. Like I, I die, I've died a lot. And not just like you die and you wake up. It's like, like experiencing like, like a whole day of I'm slowly dying. And the, the sort of gradations of what that experience is like um, as a regular thing like that was like it was a, a theme um, of my dreams I don't think that's what you're where you're asking me to go <laughs> um, oh no I was asking you to go wherever you're gonna go yeah um, but I, but I do think it, it was an original conduit of creativity that I was able to appreciate it and experience well before I thought about consciously trying to create. Um, it was an unconscious place that I was doing that from. Is Donnie Darko one of your favorite movies? <laughs> it's not. <laughs> um, and I don't dislike it at all. Um, I really like the movie. I think it's really weird. Mostly it fit these brothers. And this, it's in the book, that's why. The, the brothers love the, the movie and um, they sort of obsess over it a little bit. The idea that they would stumble into this yeah. movie yeah. fascinated me. Um, there are aspects of the movie that, are, um, that fit with some of what the characters are going through. And um, I, I, was, I just happened to find this tie at the last minute. This was like one of the last drafts where I realized that the mom in Donnie Darko is the wife in Dances with Wolves. And that was a really nice oh tie my God. to find. Yeah, that's right. You said this in the book. Yeah. 
Hmm. Yeah, so it, I, I think it, there there are like aspects of s stuff that Lonnie believes around the um, some of the chakras and like stuff that he privately believes mm -hmm. that has to do with dream life and where like belief comes from um, that plays out in Donnie Darko and um, there are just and artifacts the way he thinks about artifacts later right, on right right um, there are just ways that it worked really well to to be an interface for for them and the weirdness of reality that they were experiencing and the way time has this weird influence after Orville gets shot and thinking about the past and mm -hmm. um, Opal finds this box that's from the past that really opens up a kind of portal. Um, and so this sort of time traveling theme is in the book and, and that's in Donnie Darko. And yeah. it's kind of from an unexpected and weird place, um, but I, I liked that for the boys. Oh yeah, I liked it too. Yeah, I have daughters, so that was a that was a movie that they always talked about. Um, you know, I love how the images you use. There's so many layerings of images. You know, there's the stars, the wandering stars, the bullet that is a wandering star, the dog star, the dogs, the dog soldiers, and you seem to effortlessly put them on top of each other in and and they pop up all the time did you were you at first were you aware you were coming back or did you do this and say now i i i've got some here and i want to develop them how did you do it i would love to hear your experience with the porousness of novels also after i try to answer that um, I feel like you make the decision to get involved with a novel mm. and things go into it, but then things also sort of come out of it. And, and where it's coming out of is your unconscious and also like things you end up stumbling into that you, this process of discovery that you, you didn't know what was there, like why would why would, for instance, I thought of the idea "Wandering Stars" for a novel title before anything came, anything else came. Really. In March of 2018, um, I was signing books in a warehouse in north of, of Baltimore, of signing there there, no plans of writing a sequel, and they play uh, a Spotify. Um, radio station based on having There There by Radiohead as the root and a Portishead song, Wandering Star, comes on. Yeah. And for whatever reason, immediately I'm like, I'm writing a sequel and it's going to be called Wandering Stars. No idea why I was convinced of that. It makes no sense. And I've just realized that it makes no sense like six years after finishing it. And uh, people <laughs> are asking me like, what is, what is this? And I'm like, what is this? Uh, why was I convinced upon hearing a song that that would be... Th and so then things start appearing that feel connected to something that feels beyond me. So, like, I was in Sweden um, at a museum um, for the Swedish translation of There, There. I was already starting to write the sequel um, to There, There that was I was calling Wandering Stars with no justification. Um, and I find out about this prison castle, um, Fort Marion, yeah. and, and that half of the prisoners of war who were there were Southern Cheyennes. Yeah. It's my tribe, and I'm like, oh my god, my tribe is tied to like the origin of boarding schools. This is horrible. But also, like, I want to know about how that works. How did we get involved? And then I come to find out that the the prison castle itself is shaped like a star. It's called a star fort. Where it was built was the very first European colony in the United States, in the contiguous United States. Um, you know, the whole discovery by Columbus yep. in the Caribbean is an absurd idea of like discovering America. It's like people who come from the Caribbean, we wouldn't even allow into the country. And yet he discovered America there. Like, how does that make any sense? <laughs> 
I really don't. I can't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I find out also that I find a list of prisoners that were there, yeah. and one of them's name was Star, um, and it was a Southern Cheyenne person, and another prisoner was named Bear Shield, and that's a family from there there. So mm -hmm. I realized when I was doing that research um, that I was going to try to write this family line that goes from basically the Sand Creek Massacre through the Fort Marion um, prisoner of war origin story of the boarding schools into the boarding schools into getting the family to Oakland somehow to, to make this generational thing work that ends up in the aftermath of what happens at the end of there there. I was going to ask you about this because I was going to ask if you felt like um, sometimes I think that word research it's like it's searching for you yes. and that you don't know it but it's in there and it seems as though you are being drawn magnetically to something and it you don't really know but it sounds like that's what happened it's very spooky yeah and um you know i'm i'm um sort of believe in everything and nothing kind of person. Mm -hmm. I'm super superstitious, but I'm also like, no, none of what you're saying sounds believable when people bring up anything. <laughs> um, I, I'm just sort of both, but with, with getting involved with the novel, there's a lot of spooky stuff that happens that very much feels like, am I researching or is the searching reing me i don't know how you could reverse yeah that. but it does feel like it does the feel stuff like is that. being put on you yeah to find yeah um and it feels sometimes like even like there's an ancestor nod here and there happening where you're you're being used as an instrument for something that's bigger than what you are i i know what you mean yeah yeah We're getting very solemn should we do the um Shall we do our, our data collection? Yes. Okay. We should definitely ask. We're that. going to change. We're going to do our data collection. So we were talking about, well, first of all, the Twin Cities. So a couple of things, we're talking about them. A couple of things about us is that, uh, number one, we're the highest per capita jello eaters in <laughs> the United States. We are. I mean, this was a few years ago. Maybe we're now eating kale. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, you're like, I can't accept this. <laughs> but also, the highest, um, you have the highest rate of people checking out or buying books and actually following through and reading them. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know how that was arrived at, but I did read it. I s also, now we have to ask a question because it's the Twin Cities. Do we have a lot of twins? Can you raise your hand? Either if there's twins in your immediate family, I know there's going to be a few hands, but if you're a twin. Also, bonus points, and please speak up, if you're a librarian who has found jello stains on books. <laughs> Really yes. been read. <laughs> that would verify certain data that we were trying to also trying to collect. All right, so the twin question, twins. Well, okay, this is like really 100%. astounding because are twins more apt to sit in the front? <laughs> were you front of the class people? Yep. Oh my gosh. <laughs> because really, so you, sir, are the farthest back twin that I can see <laughs> right here um, with the checkered shirt. That's you. Twi <laughs> yeah, raise both hands. <laughs> and I don't think, okay, there was fewer than I thought, but everyone was sitting in front. Is there anybody that I missed way in the back? Yes. Oh, all right. An outlier, but 
A fabulous outlier. Yes, two fabulous outliers. It's like 15% of the audience, which I think is higher than the national average. <laughs> All right, we'll say it then. It's because there's a lot more tw people who are twins here. There's more twins in the Twin Cities. All right. What was that? It's the Jello. <laughs> the Jello does have an effect. A sort of, you know, changes the DNA, everything, whatever. Yeah. Um, God, I wrote a lot of questions down here. What did I, what was I going to ask you? Oh, God. Uh, well, how, so I was going to ask you to read from the book, and I think this is a good time for it. Uh, what I was going to ask you to read is on page 246. It's just this beautiful paragraph. It's really beautiful. It's, um, it starts, I began to think of my time. And where does it end? Well, it could end at cloud or wherever you want it to cloud. end. Wherever you want. Oh, you said paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> okay, whatever, whatever, you could keep going too. No, I'll read the paragraph. So, um, one of the characters, um, she finds out she has cancer and, and she's getting treatment for it. This, that's the context. You probably would have gotten that soon into the <laughs> reading. I began to think of my time after the drugs had been portaled into me, when I could do nothing but sit in the hospital room I began to think of it all as the gray area. I had been warned about the fatigue, the fog, the pain, the numbness. But no matter about warnings, with some things you just can't know until you know. The stuff felt more like deletion than depletion, like a part of me was being permanently erased or replaced with gray, 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 grayness. If I knew at the very least that I was still alive, I was having a good day. On other days, I had to believe what I was doing could still be called living. The days did not pass, but cracked open, then fizzled out into nothingness. And the nothingness was me, just as the endless gray became me. I was the gray area, between the living and the dead, drifting and shrinking like a cloud. All right, that had a lot of stars on it because that is exactly what it's like, but it wasn't actually what I was going to ask you to read. <laughs> <laughs> so can you read the paragraph on basically the next page? <laughs> it's actually on... Um, 246, and it starts with Jude Starr. 246. Did, wait, no. I have a book that says 240. It's on 248. 248. Jude Starr, starting with Jude Starr. That paragraph? <laughs> yes. Jude Starr would have been my great-grandfather. My great-grandfather survived the Sand Creek Massacre, and his son survived boarding schools, and his daughter, my mother, survived losing her mother and being raised by white people. It still brought us up knowing who we were, who we are, somehow. So why had I been sheltering the boys from their culture? Something made so strong it survived more than it should have survived. It was more than survival. The culture sings. The culture dances. The culture keeps telling stories that bring you into them, take you away from your life and bring you back better made. That was from the pages I was reading, hoping in the hospital to come back from what I was going through better made. I felt so close to death that I had to. If I survived, 
I had to come back better made. Wow, I really love that. It's just a lot in there that that is it's so resonant because that's what the culture does. And in the beginning, you have Richard Henry Pratt trying to you in desperately trying. Actually, it was. Uh, educate or exterminate. So there was his reasoning was if he could prove that he could educate Indians at the time, then that would be an amazing <laughs> that would be an amazing thing. But of course, what it turned into is very different. And um, so there's all these attempts to assimilate everyone, and then it comes down to her, not assimilated at all. And I just love how, how you put this. So did this come to you partly through, I don't know, there's so much storytelling in the book. And storytelling had to be a big part of your life. And then wanting to tell stories. And maybe you said you didn't really start being creative till 25, but then were they all just stored up or what happened? <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, I don't know because I didn't grow up with any storytellers. Mm. Um, if anything, I feel like the absence of story was maybe the thing building up to when I finally realized what a novel was and what mm -hmm. fiction could do. I knew I had this um this material and this experience um that was related to what storytelling was what fiction was because i didn't right. know i i just really had no clue as a young student like what why we had to read these books what value there was i i didn't have a relationship to it my family didn't grow up um talking about books or like what are you going to do for college like the emphasis at home was um god in this very serious way ah. um so like my mom evangelical christian yeah my dad native american church mm -hmm. but both like hardcore the most important thing that you need to know in life is your relationship with god saying that to like a four-year-old and i'm like what <laughs> <laughs> Um, and like, if you don't accept Jesus into your heart, you'll go to hell forever. <laughs> sort of yeah. like early on, like this, the world's going to end. So things that are not like, I'm not thinking about the future and my place in it mm -hmm. in terms of like investing in school or, or in myself as, as somebody who has a future, more so like my inability to let Jesus into my heart. And the fear, the resultant fear, was like a lot of my childhood experience. And so by the time I found fiction, um, I really went at it with this religious fervor. Yeah. And this like, oh, the fiction fills in every single hole that I, hmm. uh, that I had. And fiction really, you know, and still is it for me. Yeah. The thing that was created and, and became this whole... Um, fiction really ended up being it for me. Well, did you also, was there a lot of emphasis on on reading, Bible reading and Bible uh, story? Did you also read the Old Testament besides the Evan? There wasn't that no, much emphasis really. on the on Bible reading. Um, I, I would read, I was obsessed with Revelation the book of Revelation, mm. because I was looking for signs for like, what do we need to look for? It's like about to go down. And at the last minute, I'm going to be like, Jesus, please get into my heart so I don't <laughs> go to hell forever. Um, really, it was not, you know, the Bible is like, it is a part of it, but it was like a, a church community where it was, uh, you get slain in the spirit. Mm. And my mom, I just found out two years ago, my mom, when I was born, and she was being rolled into the hospital in a, in a wheelchair by my dad, was speaking in tongues as she was ha going into labor. What? So this is like the intensity of yeah of the that's what it was going on. So in church, you know, like 
when I was like eight years old, I went in front of the church. There was a <clears throat> whole line of people um, who go up to like be slain in the spirit. And this was like my last effort at like, I'm going to try, like, Jesus, do your thing if you're going to do it, because like this is, this is me giving it my all. And I see there's this line of people that are just getting knocked down by two fingers, and the, the pastor just sort of, you know, doing his mm -hmm. thing. And I see these people just falling back. And there's people behind, lined up behind everybody to catch the falling bodies. Right. And everybody's getting slain in the spirit. And it comes up to me, and I'm like, this is it. Jesus, do the thing. And he tips my head back, and I just go. <laughs> I was like, I'm just going to say. <laughs> I, just, I try. A, a gift to fiction. A gift to, a gift to fiction. I, yeah, and then f fiction really was the, the only thing that ever filled that same space. So when you started writing, did you just immediately give yourself over to it? I said, yeah. fiction, enter my heart so that I... <laughs> 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 no, I, I, I felt very behind because a lot of writers start really early hmm. and I wasn't writing at all. And I was like 24 years old and I was like, I have a lot of catching up to do. So I, for the next nine years, I read and wrote just whenever I could uh, when I wasn't working. Um, just in private, just it became a private devotion. Like I need yeah. to catch up. If I'm going to take this seriously, I need to like devote myself. Um, and that's just all I did. I moved away from from Oakland a, a few different times to just work, like restaurant jobs or other mm -hmm. random jobs, and to be able to just write and read as much as I could. Um, so that was it. Just became something I was. There was a religious fervor to it for sure. Yeah. And then, um, I mean, everybody asks, but were there any books that just hit you like you're describing being struck by books? I mean, it was, it was, it was kind of a slow process. And, and I was, it was completely self-guided. So mm -hmm. that was, that was, in retrospect, I didn't know at the time, I was just finding it on my own, on my own terms. But I just instinctually just read whatever... Um, there was a lot of works in translation. I realized I would follow publishers like uh, New Directions and NYRB. Yeah, so I would look for yeah. spines and sort of the symbols of the publishers that I realized that I love the stuff that they do. Mm -hmm. um, there was two early novels for sure. Um, Confederacy of Dunces and The Bell Jar were like two novels that also were coupled, I think coupled with the lore of the authors who killed themselves. Mm -hmm. And something about the urgency of people that were working to like, you can write a novel and have the passion and sincerity to, to do something like that, but also like hate yourself so much you kill yourself. There was something about the tortured nature and urgency of those figures, I think that drew me to, yeah. to, to fiction early on. But it really became, you know, like Clarice Lispector was one of the Robert Walzer, like mm -hmm. these weird writers that were doing stuff with with consciousness and and writing that was that felt Borges, like people yeah. that were doing Kafka were huge influences really early on that it was like, oh I, fiction can sort of do anything. And that was like a permission that I didn't even know was there to be granted. And that was a really cool part of the discovery of like what can fiction not do and finding out that you know it's boundless it does seem boundless and it's such a great way to place to to end it's 709 and but the the person who's supposed to be over here going like this isn't doing it <laughs> so rob can we keep going or do you want to start Asking questions. I, were you always over there? Why don't, you, why don't you ask one more question and then we'll open up the phone? Is there another piece of data we should gather? Is, what did you say? Another piece of data we should gather. Oh my God, another piece of data. I'm going to 
turn that over to you because I get to be the um, I get to interrogate. Okay. How excited are all of you that Luis has another novel coming out this year in October? Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm going to do the grandma thing. <laughs> I just found out, and I'm just genuinely excited. Oh, that's really kind. Well, okay. Uh, I'm, just, I'm going to ask you another question now. What's my hardest question? <laughs> okay. Uh, dang. I asked almost all my questions. Um, Layers of speech changing the substance. We don't want to get into substance abuse. It's too late for that. <laughs> There's just not enough time to cover substance abuse. But it's all in here. And this is just the way. <laughs> Look at that. See. I took I really a picture earlier of it. This is going to be was, a frame. I was telling Hyde that it was to um, scare you, but actually that is the way I read. But it happened to match the cover even. <laughs> so um, now I've chatted for a minute. Uh, oh, we didn't talk about flight. And there's people are, did, so let me bring this back to the beginning. I'm sorry, but you, even if you go like this, I can't stop now. Um, so bring it back to the beginning and talk about dreams and do you fly in dreams as well as die in dreams? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's been... I'm so glad. That's been as recurring as dying. Is really? Flying. 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 It's been a huge part. And, and I've, I've had the fortune or blessing or whatever you want to call it to... I think certain kids naturally lucid dream. Yeah. And me and my friend group, we did as kids... And so the first thing, every time I've realized it's a dream, is to fly. Oh. Um, it's like the, the first thing that I do. I haven't lucid dreamed in a long time, um, but I, as a kid, it was a, I had a very active dream life. Yeah. And flight was a huge part of oh. why I wanted to keep doing that, having that experience. All right. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you. All right. Now... Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Tommy. And now is one of the best parts of the program. It's a chance for you and the audience to ask your questions for Tommy Orange. So if you just raise your hand, I will make my way to you and give you the mic. Looks like we've got one in the center over here. Tommy, I'd like to know Sir, wait until you get the microphone. <laughs> Thank you. He's twin. a twin. It's a twin. twin. I'd, like to, I'd, like, I'd like to know how you fly. Different ways, same way. What's your means of propulsion? Do you have a cape? <laughs> no cape. Um, it's weird. The belief comes from like right here. It's like between your heart and your stomach. Like a, there's a muscle, and it's a will power thing. Um, and you have to believe, and a belief is a big part of it. So a lot of situations, I'll sort of jump off of a cliff situation and if I don't find the muscle I'll fall to my death um, and so it's there's that there's you know there's other times that I've been chased by horrible beings and flight will become of a means of escape um, so there's a lot of different variations on the way but it's always with this sort of muscle um, of will and somewhere between heart and stomach we're back in the center of the auditorium here. Hi. Um, I read an article in the New York Times just recently about a talk you did at a school in the Bronx, and it was so touching. And I, I, I wonder what that was like. Can you give voice to having a group of students who are so engaged with your work? Yeah, it was an incredible experience. I, I started off there, the there, there book tour um, 
completely terrified of high school students. <laughs> so I, I had an early Good one. There was reason. an early adapter teacher who like pushed through whatever red tape and curriculum stuff she had to push through to get there, there taught to high school students, like right as there, there came out, which was crazy thinking back. And it was one of the scariest events I did at the start of the book tour was to to read in in front of high school students and to talk to them because I just feel like I'm back in high school and everything's scary and um, everyone's judging me. Um, now I've, I've done enough of these things that it's like the sweetest possible thing. And this group of kids was uh, incredible. Um, so I just feel so grateful for the experience. Um, I had an experience in Oakland that was not the same like warm, soft, sweet, glowy thing, but like a cool Oakland thing that happened. So I went to a school and we, the, the kids interviewed me in front of like a local TV uh, camera crew and um, everyone was really sweet and there was like 200 high school kids who kept quiet during the recording, which alone was like respect. Um, <laughs> So I was going out to my car after the whole thing was done, and this is like, this is in deep East Oakland, which um, is a rougher part of Oakland. And, and I saw this group of kids coming back from lunch because it was like an off-campus lunch situation. This group of guys, um, and in my mind, I'm all of a sudden I'm like super small, and they're like towering, <laughs> and loud, and um, I try to get to my car as soon as I can. And one of them yells out, hey. Um, and I turn around, and he's like, I fuck with your book. <laughs> and I was like, oh. <laughs> and it was like the coolest, you know, it was the, it was the coolest recognition that he, he reads, he likes the book. Like, normally he maybe doesn't fuck with other books. <laughs> um, and and so this this group of kids in the Bronx was... The teacher just emailed like my people randomly and and had this is the sweetest email and then the kids like just fully like love the characters in the book and it was this crazy experience that I'll never forget um, and um, I hope you know I hope that Wandering Stars isn't too depressing for the kids and the, and that they continue to read my books. <laughs> Hi. I was at a reading with Kaveh Akbar at Moon Palace Books here in town and was really touched by his saying that you and he exchange writing. And I just would like you to talk about that a little bit. Um, it was just very impressive to me that at your level of writing, you're, you have a writing partner. Yeah, so we met and uh, I did an event at Purdue. Um, I had already known about his work and I didn't know that he knew mine and we just happened to be at this dinner um, after my reading. And um, I ended up in his car as we went to this other social thing. Um, and I was with his wife. And um, and he was like, what's the craziest thing that's ever happened to you because of the success of There There? And I was like, I got to do a Simpsons table read. <laughs> um, and he said, fuck you. <laughs> like he was like... Like in a way that like he loves The Simpsons, <laughs> that I got to do that was like, he sincerely was like, "Fuck you." <laughs> um, and it was from there like we 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 just I realized how much we had in common. There's like a thousand things that we've realized that we have in common since then, and um, so his wife Paige Lewis, um, they were in the car with us and talking about their book, um, Space Struck which is a great book of poetry. It's amazing. Um, but I, when, when they said it, I heard space truck. I was like, what's a space truck? This is well before Elon ruined any idea of what a space <laughs> truck might be. Um, and so I ended up emailing Cave a very embarrassing poem called Space Truck. <laughs> um, and we went back and forth, just kind of tongue-in-cheek, 
but ultimately just realized that we loved each other and, and had respect for each other's writing in a way that, and I also, I, I want to convince all poets to write novels instead of poetry books. Um, and it was on this mission of like, you need to write a novel instead of poetry. Um, and he, but he wanted to, and so we, from 2019 to when our books came out, we were exchanging pages every Friday. Um, and you know, we're like best friends now. Tommy, we're in the back center of the auditorium. Uh, last year I read uh, A Council of Dolls and I ended up feeling like your book is sort of a sibling or first cousin. Uh, I loved your book. I think it's terrific. Um, and it, as soon as I started in on your narrative, your history in the first part, it just came to me like this, boy, the, these two are on the same wavelength. Thank you. I, re I recently had an exchange on Facebook with with Mona, um, and actually called her book a cousin of my book, so that's very accurate. Mm. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask more about some of your musical influences growing up in Oakland and kind of coming of age at the height of some of the most prolific lyricists in musical history, if that was an influence on you or who you're listening to now or what that was like. So I wasn't really into, I'm born in 82. And so, um, you know, a lot of amazing things happening in the 90s um, in Oakland, in hip hop history specifically. But I wasn't, I wasn't really listening to music um, as a young person. I have a memory of when I was in middle school. Um, somebody asked me at, a, at the bus stop, it's like, so what kind of music do you listen to? Just trying to start a conversation. I was like, I don't really listen to music, um, which is a weird answer. Um, I don't know why I said that. But I didn't have like my own tastes. I was like, my parents listened to like oldies, you know, like Motown and, my dad would listen to, whenever we were in the truck, it was peyote tapes, that's what we called them. So it was just peyote music blasting um, through Oakland, as wherever we went. Um, and so I did end up being deeply influenced by music. I became a musician before I was a writer, and I went to school for sound engineering. And, and hip hop was an was, was a early influence on um, my thinking about language and, and the ways to express language, for sure. Um, but it wasn't, I can't say that it was like a part of my coming of age or growing up. It, it was much more like um, me finding art as a viable anything was felt like a fluke. And, and, and I was convinced by it through music first and then writing. Um, and, and continue to love and, and discover new music. Like I, I watch every Friday for what's coming out, just like every Tuesday for books, I'm like on what's coming out. So I'm very, I, I stay interested in, in the new sounds that are being made, just like I do with books too. Um, both of your books cover so many different individuals, and I was wondering how you balance exploring individual narratives with moving the overarching story forward. I mean, I think I'm a little bit distractible, and so I like to be working on a lot of things at once. Um, and I think that's part of what helps me to stay focused on one whole project, is that I can be jumping around within a project and still be working on the project instead of like, you know, totally working on a different book um, because I want to suddenly explore second person future tense or something, you know, like technical. Um, so I, th I think it's just a part of my process to be able to jump around within the one project. It's helpful to me. 
We do have time for one more question, and good, we've got one right over here. But before we take it, I just want to let everyone know that the evening doesn't end here. Tommy will be signing books um, out in the lobby after the program, and we have our wonderful event partner, Birch Park Books, who is here supporting those book sales. So please make sure you stop by and get your copies of that book if you have not done so yet. Um, the signing will be right after the program. Also, if you're listening online, you can go to birchbarkbooks.com and order your book there. Um, Birchbark is one of the most incredible resources we have in this community. So thank you for supporting Birchbark and the library. We appreciate it. And now, yes. Thank you. <laughs> also, so it, it, your book is not depressing. <laughs> so beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's not. Hi, Tommy. Thank you for being here, coming to our town, uh, Jello and all. Uh, <laughs> putting you on the spot, what's your favorite Louise Erdrich novel? <laughs> and what do you don't, what don't do you answer. look to her don't uh, answer. in admiration <laughs> uh, for your own work? Well, it's easy because I already, earlier in an interview, I already answered this question. So I already have it. Um, but it's a tie between um, the Roundhouse and Love Medicine. Um, and that is based on the impact that the two books had on my life uh, because I think the body of work is, I can't even speak to what, how much is happening. And I, I can't qualify, um, you know, a, a ranking system for what the body of work is doing. It's beyond me. But personal impact wise, Love Medicine and the Roundhouse just had the most effect on me and thinking about what what books can do. And with that eloquent answer, we bring tonight's program to a close. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you to Louise Erdrich and Tommy Orange. Tommy. Tommy. Thank you.